Good day, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Wyatt Technology Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to Biotherapeutics Form and Function, Case Studies in Light Scattering. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and the moderator for today's event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Dr. Sophia Kenrick, PhD. She is Senior Application Scientist with Wyatt Technology Corporation. And our second presenter today is Dr. Katherine Bowers, PhD, Principal Scientist and Group Leader, Analytical and Formulation Development, Fujifilm Biosynth Biotechnologies. So with that, I will turn things over to our very first presenter, Sophia Kenrick. Welcome. The presenter ball is yours. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for that introduction. I'm really delighted to be able to present this webinar together with Catherine and hope that uh, everyone here listening will be able to get some new information about how to characterize their biotherapeutics and biomolecular formulations with light scattering. So in this webinar, we'll present several case studies of how light scattering can be used in support of assay and formulation development. These applications can range from preliminary studies, quantifying molar mass of a particular sample and the amount of aggregate, and often size exclusion chromatography is used to determine the molecular weight and the aggregate content of a sample. And I hope I'll show you through this webinar that coupling MALS or multi-angle light scattering to that kind of a, a setup is really essential for first principles measurement of molar mass and oligomeric state. I'll give a short example um, in, of this application, but the majority of this webinar is actually going to be dedicated to what we call a batch experiment, so using light scattering on unfractionated samples. And as I hope we'll show, these techniques open up a world of analyses that will help you in your biotherapeutic development. Uh, Catherine is actually going to be presenting several case studies utilizing both multi-angle light scattering or MALS and dynamic light scattering to support development and optimization of different formulations. And so this is going to include looking at the colloidal stability of an antibody formulation, understanding how an enzyme's activity depends on how you formulate it, and uh, some unexpected behavior that can happen as you formulate things at high concentrations. But before we get to that, I'm going to be introducing the different light scattering techniques that you'll see throughout this webinar. So first is multi-angle light scattering, or MALS. This is also known as static light scattering. And so using this technique, we could measure from first principles the absolute molar mass and root mean square radius of the molecules or particles in our solution. The second technique is dynamic light scattering, or DLS. And this lets us measure the diffusion of molecules and particles in solution, so we can calculate their hydrodynamic radius, or RH. And as I mentioned before, we're going to focus on the application of these techniques to batch, or unfractionated samples. And so we're going to see how these measurements can be made as a function of composition or concentration. And that's going to tell us about different interactions among our molecules. So as we're talking about light scattering throughout the webinar, I want you to keep this picture in mind, where we have some kind of measurement volume illuminated by a laser. And most of this light is going to pass all the way through, but some of this light is going to be scattered in all directions. We can measure the scattering intensity as a function of angle, as a function of concentration, and as a function of time in order to get different quantities about our sample. And so that first basic principle of light scattering is that the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to the molar mass and the mass concentration of the molecule. So if you know or you can measure your concentration and you measure your scattering intensity, then you can get molar mass directly from first principles uh, without needing any kind of molar mass standard or any kind of assumption about the size or the shape of your molecule. The second basic light scattering principle is that as you measure the scattering intensity as a function of different angles, you can get information about the size of your molecule or particle. So we'll take this case 
of a small particle, which we call an isotropic scatterer. So molecules or particles with a radius less than about 10 nanometers are going to scatter light evenly in all directions. So we would measure the same intensity at any point along this scattering sphere here. As the molecules get larger than 10 nanometers, they're going to start to scatter anisotropically. So we'll have a higher scattering intensity at the forward angles, at, at low angles, compared to in this back direction at high angles. And by measuring that intensity as a function of angle, we can get an RMS radius, or root mean square size, of the molecule or particle in addition to the molar mass. Um, so now given these principles, we can answer the question, why do you need multi-angle light scattering? So I mentioned before that an isotropic scatterer will scatter the same amount of light evenly in all directions. So think of most protein monomers or small ligamers um, and linear polymers less than about 100 kilodaltons. And so here's a plot of the scattering intensity versus scattering in, uh, angle for three molecules with radii of one, two, or five nanometers. Uh, as you can see, this intensity is invariant with angle. And so we can measure at any point uh, to determine the molar mass, which would be given here by the y-intercept. Ideally, we would do this measurement at three independent angles so that we can confirm that, yes, this is isotropic, and make sure that we get the correct molar mass over here from the intercept. Now, as we get to slightly bigger particles, like a large aggregate, um, a virus-like particle, or some high molecular weight particles, you'll see that that scattering intensity is going to vary with angle. And we can measure that scattering the, the variation in that scattering intensity and get an RMS radius for those particles. And you can see we're going to measure here at these same three angles. So in practice, these three angle measurements are made with our Wyatt mini Don trios or our Microdon. The trios is perfect for standard HPLC applications as well as the batch applications that will be featured in this webinar. And the Microdon is specifically designed for the very small volume peaks that elute during ultra-high performance chromatography or UHPLC. So lastly, let's consider really large particles, uh, like larger viruses, liposomes, and other particles with radius up to 500 nanometers. As you can see in this bottom figure, the scattering intensity is really highly nonlinear as a function of angle. And these three measurement angles are not sufficient to capture the entire curvature and give us an accurate size and accurate molecular weight. But with 18 measurement angles, uh, like in our Don Helios, we can capture this entire curvature and are able to measure both the size and the molar mass. And so with this kind of an experiment, with this kind of instrumentation, we can go, like I said, up to sizes of 500 nanometers or molar masses about uh, 10 to the 9 grams per mole. The next natural question, of course, is how we apply these techniques. Arguably, the most common configuration for a multi-angle light scattering detector is in line with HPLC or UHPLC and a size exclusion column. Oh, so we call this SECMALS, or size exclusion chromatography with MALS. Um, here you see our typical configuration. And a light scattering detector, like the Helios or Trios or the Microdon, is here at position 5, just after the column and any UV detector. We're also going to include a refractive index detector, like the T-Rex or U-T-Rex, as a universal concentration detector. Now, if you were to do conventional SEC, you would get either a single UV trace or a single RI trace for your chromatogram. But now, with SECMALS, we're going to be adding a light scattering intensity in addition to this concentration trace. And so all the way across the peak, we'll be measuring that light scattering intensity. And you, we'll take this example of, at this black vertical line. So this cursor represents a single point across the chromatogram. We can take the scattering intensity and the concentration 
and get a molecular weight right at that point in the chromatogram. And remember, we're not just measuring this at a single detection angle. We're measuring across multiple angles simultaneously. And so uh, we can blow up that data point into this graph here on the right. And so you can see the scattering intensity as a function of scattering angle. And the slope of that is going to give us the RMS radius. Uh, in this case, it's 11 and a half nanometers. And the y-intercept is where that uh, molecular weight comes from. So let's see what this means for a real uh, size exclusion chromatography experiment. So here I've overlaid three chromatograms from three different molecules. These were actually measured with UHPLC, so you can see that the elution volume is very small, it's less than three milliliters. If this were just traditional SEC, I would compare the elution volume of these three peaks to the elution volume of a panel of standards. And I would assume that molecule number one is the biggest, followed closely by number two, and then number three is much smaller. Fortunately, I have multi-angle light scattering, so I don't need to make these assumptions. Instead, I'm able to measure the light scattering intensity in addition to the concentration. And so at every point along this chromatogram, I'm going to get scattering from the three angles of our microdon and be able to measure that molar mass. So here in the bottom panel, you see a portion of the chromatogram from molecule number one. And here's the light scattering intensity at the apex of that peak. So for each point along this peak, we can calculate a molar mass. And I've overlaid that on the top graph here. So each of these points in blue represents the measured molar mass across this blue chromatogram for number one. Um, each of these points in red represents the molar mass for the chromatogram in number two, and so on. So lo and behold, protein number one at 146 kilodaltons actually has uh, the lowest molar mass of these three. It's slightly lower than protein number two at 152 kilodaltons. And protein number three kind of splits the difference right at 150. So you might ask yourself, uh, why are these molecules eluding at such different times if their molar masses are so similar? One possibility is that their hydrodynamic size is actually different. And so we can probe that hydrodynamic size with what's called dynamic light scattering. So dynamic light scattering, or DLS, measures the diffusion of molecules and particles in solution. So by looking at the fluctuations in the light scattering intensity, we can measure that diffusion coefficient and, and relate that to a size. So you can imagine these molecules are in solution, uh, illuminated by a laser. And depending on what uh, configuration they are relative to each other, the light that's being scattered is adding constructively or destructively at this detector. And so when they're in one configuration, like shown in this picture, the scattering intensity is adding destructively, and the total intensity is ever so slightly less than the average. And then as they rant, mock around, they can, the scattering intensities can add constructively and be ever so slightly greater than average. And these fluctuations take place on a very fast time scale. In dynamic light scattering, we're going to perform an autocorrelation uh, analysis on those intensity fluctuations. And the decay rate of this autocorrelation function is proportional to the diffusion coefficient of the molecules. We can then use the Stokes-Einstein relationship to calculate a hydrodynamic radius from the dif measured diffusion coefficient. So here I'm showing a typical hydrodynamic radius distribution for an IgG. The mean hydrodynamic radius is six and a half nanometers, as you can see in this graph. And this also illustrates one of the great advantages of DLS. Um, it can measure size for molecules below that 10 nanometer threshold, even down to about a half a nanometer, which is much smaller than moles can measure for size. So we can combine the size from DLS with the molar mass from moles and get a complete picture of our biotherapeutic.
we can actually incorporate a dynamic light scattering detector inside any of our Wyatt Mall's detectors so that you can get those two measurements simultaneously. Here's a schematic of our trios. The three static detectors are over here on the left, and the optional dynamic light scattering detector is coming off over here on the right. This allows us to perform both measurements at the same time and in the same measurement volume, which is really important because that means we're not diluting the sample or broadening the peak at all between the measurements. So now let's see what that looks like for our previous antibody example. Um, here are those same chromatograms from our monoclonal antibodies. And so now instead of overlaying molar mass, I'm overlaying the hydrodynamic radius measured by DLS. So you can see that all three of these molecules have about the same size at 5.2 nanometers. And so that tells us that our SEC separation is non-ideal. Uh, they're not actually being separated by the hydrodynamic volume in this case. And so there's some kind of column interaction that's slowing protein number three down relative to the other two. And so having that molar mass from the static detectors and the size from the dynamic detector is really the only way to know that. Another common application of dynamic light scattering is in batch mode. So taking an unfractionated sample and using that to measure size. And these measurements can be done in a cuvette, like with our uh, NanoStar, or in a high throughput multi-well plate using our plate reader. As you can see in this bottom figure, even without separation, so even without chromatography, we can get some information about the number of species that are in that solution. So in this histogram, you can see two distinct peaks. One population that's at about six nanometers, so that's our monomer or some oligomers, and then a second population at about 100 nanometers, which would be some large aggregate or other contamination. I mentioned in the introduction that the rest of this presentation will be focused on these types of unfractionated or batch uh, analyses. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes just discussing what we can measure with both batch and uh, both batch DLS and MALS. One of the most common applications for batch DLS, especially with the plate reader, is for formulation screening. So here you can see a typical plate loaded with various formulations, and we can measure the radius distributions in each of those different wells. And based on that measurement, you can categorize the formulations as having no aggregates or moderate aggregation or just completely aggregated. Um, and then those low aggregation samples that are color-coded in red on this plot can be further developed. This graphic shows data from a 96-well plate but our plate reader can be used to measure samples in 384 and also 1536 well plate formats. A second popular application for DLS is to investigate thermal stability. So within the NanoStar plate reader, you can observe the change in size as a function of temperature. And so that allows you to look at the onset of unfolding or the onset of uh, aggregation. The nice thing about DLS is that you're measuring the size directly. So you can distinguish between a simple unfolding and an aggregation into much higher species. Finally, you can look at the concentration dependence in a DLS experiment to get a sense of the colloidal stability of a molecule. So if you have uh, an attractive intermolecular interaction, the diffusion coefficient will appear, appear to decrease as a function of concentration, and the hydrodynamic radius will appear to increase. Similarly, if you have a repulsive interaction, the diffusion coefficient will appear to increase, and the hydrodynamic radius will appear to decrease. We can also use a batch static light scattering experiment or batch MALS experiment to do these same kinds of interactions analyses. So here I'm showing a light scattering trace with six different plateaus. And each of these plateaus represents a different concentration of the same sample. From the light scattering intensity as a function of concentration, we can get the molar mass of that sample. 
and specifically we get a weight average molar mass. So this includes any irreversible aggregates or any reversible oligomers that are being formed in that solution as you change the concentration. Uh, what's really nice is that this technique now is orthogonal to your SEC mol's molecular weight. So if you look at the weight average molar mass across all of your eluding peaks and compare that to the weight average molar mass you get in batch, you should get the same answer. Um, if you get something different, it might mean that your column is removing or shearing your sample, and so that can tell you a little bit more about what's in your solution. A concentration dependence in the static light scattering intensity can also tell us about intermolecular interactions. These can be nonspecific uh, attraction and repulsion, or it can be a specific equilibrium association with some kind of affinity and some stoichiometry. And I'll go into more detail about each of these, how each of these is calculated. Traditionally, a batch static light scattering experiment is analyzed to determine what's called the second virial coefficient. Um, as shown here, this virial expansion is used to describe different thermodynamic non-ideality in your solution. The interactions are going to cause a change in the scattering intensity as a function of concentration, uh, which I've plotted here on the left, and that's going to make a similar change in the apparent molar mass as a function of concentration, which I have here on the right. So in an ideal solution where we have no interactions or where A2 equals zero, the light scattering intensity should just increase linearly with concentration, and the slope of that line is a constant molecular weight all the way across. Your typical formulation is going to be non-ideal, though, and it's going to have some kind of interaction between the molecules. Uh, repulsive interaction is going to give a, second virial a positive value for the second virial coefficient, and I'm going to cause the light scattering intensity to increase slower than linear, it's going to cause the molar mass to appear to decrease. If we have an attractive interaction, we're going to quantify that with a negative second virial coefficient. The light scattering intensity is going to increase faster than linear, and the molar mass is going to appear to increase. We could stop here with just a simple virial expansion. Um, or we can take this actually one step further, which is what we're going to be showing in the case studies. And we can fit this increase in molar mass to a specific set of equilibrium constants and to a specific set of stoichiometries. The way we do that is with composition gradient multi-angle light scattering, or CG moles. This allows us to quantify the equilibrium association and stoichiometry in a batch light scattering experiment. So in this case, our light scattering intensity is actually proportional to a sum of terms. So we have a molar mass and a concentration for each monomer, and a molar mass and concentration for all of the complexes that form. We can use this to study self-association, so like the oligomerization of insulin and other molecules, or for really weak interactions that are present at high concentration. Uh, we can also use this technique to study heteroassociation, so something as simple as an antibody-antigen association or upwards of complex assemblies with multiple different stoichiometries and different affinities at each binding site. Here we have a typical CG MALS experiment, which is similar to this previous batch light scattering experiment that I, I showed previously. So several um, injections are of different concentrations are going into our mall detector, and we're going to automate this with our Calypso instrumentation, uh, which I showed on the previous slide. So for each of these different concentrations, the Calypso is going to prepare that solution, inject it into a Helios or Trios, and then measure the molar mass as a function of concentration. Uh, we can even do this for various formulation conditions. So you can imagine adding salt or changing the pH and seeing how that affects the interactions among the molecules. As complexes form, we will see a change in the molar mass as a function of concentration. So if nothing happens and we stay monomeric, 
the molar mass will stay constant. Um, but as complexes like dimers and trimers form, we'll see that molar mass increase with concentration. And depending on the curvature and the amount of increase, we can fit the data to tell us the stoichiometry, for example, whether it's a dimer or a trimer, and what affinity that interaction takes place with. We can also use uh, CG malt and the Calypso to measure the interaction between two different biomolecules. Um, I'm just going to introduce this briefly. Uh, we don't actually we don't have a case study in this webinar, but we have other information on our website that I'm happy to, to help direct you to. Uh, but in this kind of experiment, we're going to mix together different ratios of two different molecules and probe how the molar mass changes uh, across different mixtures of species A and B. So in this uh, bottom plot, you can see some typical data for this kind of interaction. On the left-hand axis is the light scattering intensity from pure species B. And as we walk across from left to right, we're decreasing the concentration of B and simultaneously increasing the concentration of A. If nothing happens, we just get a linear change in that scattering intensity. But as complexes form and we get an increase in the molar mass, we see this characteristic curvature that tells us that we have an interaction. The shape and position of this peak also tells us about the stoichiometry of the interaction. And so we can tell if A and B have one binding site for each other or two or three. And since we're measuring the molar mass, we can, all, we can get an absolute stoichiometry and not just a stoichiometric ratio. So that's the theory part of this webinar before Catherine gets into the remaining case studies. For more information, I encourage you to visit the Wyatt website at www.wyatt.com and browse our library. We've got over 12,000 publications that cite our instruments, and then various application notes and other technical information, including our archived webinars. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Katherine Bowers. Hi. Thank you so much, Sophia, for that wonderful introduction um, to light scattering. I always learn so much by listening to you teach about all the different light scattering technologies. And to all that have joined, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today. So my portion of the talk, as Sophia had indicated, is to really talk about some case studies. And so the title of, of my presentation is The Power of Light Scattering. Light scattering in, in our businesses, uh, they're key biophysical tools for therapeutic protein characterization and development. So I always want to start my talks with saying thank you because all of this work requires so many kind people to help. And um, first person, obviously, is Sophia Henrik, who from the minute our instrument was installed over two years ago, um, she's been an amazing source of help and information and advice, and um, I just really appreciate all everything that she does for us. Um, also, Mark Spears, who's our local technician. It's so nice to have Mark only minutes away from our labs. From Fujifilm, I'd like to thank Greg Adams and Phil Ropp, um, who are the bosses, and some other people who have worked on these projects, uh, William Leonard, Denise Brown, and Mark Chavez. I know when you think about Fujifilm, you think about cameras and film and all that kind of stuff. We are literally a part of the Fujifilm Corporation. Um, we're actually a contract research and um, development organization. We're a global company with three sites in Billingham in the UK, at College Station in Texas, and here in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. We work on every molecule imaginable um, and have had over 270 molecules in process development or manufacturing and over 35 years of um, contract manufacturing experience. As a protein characterization scientist in this type of contract development and manufacturing environment, we have so many challenges that we have to face. Um, 
as protein characterization scientists. Um, the first thing is that we, we see a large variety of protein molecules. Um, no longer are we really limited to monoclonal antibodies or molecules similar to that. We're now getting into, you know, growth factors and enzymes and VLPs and conjugated proteins. So. We need methods that are uh, very flexible and universal. We also have very aggressive timelines. You know, it takes so long to get a therapeutic molecule into the market that, you know, and a lot of money, it takes a lot of money that um, clients um, come to us with very aggressive timelines. So again, the, the uh, methods that we choose to characterize our proteins, um, we have to be very selective. In our company, um, biophysical support is used across all functional areas, sometimes even starting it upstream. Definitely in downstream processing, we play a huge role in working with our process development scientists to troubleshoot the purification process, um, direct the purification process to certain buffers and elution conditions. We also, of course, use biophysical methods to support formulation development, after the formulation is made and it's getting ready to go in the clinic, we can even use it for in-use studies. So we have a selection of core biophysical assays um, that we use here at Fujifilm. They are definitely information rich, they're universal, robust, and flexible. So what I really like about light scattering, um, it, it, um, it, it's just one of my favorite techniques, and, and one of the reasons is that no matter the form that your protein is, they can't hide from the light scattering, that is. So you can look at self-associated proteins, unfolded, aggregated, you can look at conjugated proteins, fusion proteins, all the way up to these big and complex molecules like VLPs. So today I'm going to share three case studies with you. And uh, so Via actually alluded to this earlier. We're going to take a look at some monoclonal antibodies and characterizing those as a function of, its, of the formulation. And this is going to be a composition gradient or CG MALS experiment. Also going to share some data um, using an enzyme. We were doing a formulation development enzyme and it got this huge boost in activity when we changed the formulation. So again, using CG MALS, we wanted to understand what the molecule was doing in terms of liquidization. And then finally, the third example is taking an engineered protein as it journeys to a high concentration therapeutic. And this is an example where we interfaced with our downstream um, colleagues during development, and it pretty much was in real time. And finally, conclusions. So shown here on the slide are two of the instruments or, set, or instrument sets that were used for the data that I'm going to show you. The third case study used both the Dynapro plate reader as well as the CG MALS. I, I have a Dawn Helios 18 angle detector with an integrated quills and the OptiLab T-Rex. All right, so the first case study. As some of you probably know, MAP formulation development is definitely becoming more platform-based. Um, it, it's got to be fast. We're looking into toolbox formulations as well as toolbox analytical and biophysical assays so that when you're developing these monoclonal antibodies, you can do the same type of approach over and over again. And, and hopefully what happens is that you start to get a higher throughput because there's just so many, there's so many candidates to screen. Yeah, because multiple target molecules and formulations may have, probably absolutely have to be screened simultaneously. Always solubility is a major concern because MAP therapeutics tend to be at higher concentrations, usually, you know, above 50 mg per mil. Sometimes I've seen things go up to 200 mg per mil, which is crazy. It is so beneficial early in a program to understand the propensity of a monoclonal antibody to self-associate prior to actually doing large-scale purification and processing to the final 
final target concentration. It really falls into the category of risk mitigation. Um, some of these lots of protein, one lot of protein, easily a million dollars. So if you can um, predict and mitigate the propensity of the MAB to form ag aggregates or, or other issues, um, it's really beneficial to the program. All right, so the purpose of this particular experiment is that I had two target MABs, and we had selected the same final formulation for both of them. Much like happens a lot in development programs, we usually do not have a lot of protein in the beginning when we're doing formulation development. And we typically have to work at concentrations well below what our final target is going to be. Um, and so in this case, the target concentration was higher than what was used during formulation development. So prior to the final concentration process, we wanted to understand the tendency of the monoclonal antibodies to self-associate. Could we get some quick information up front before this process was to occur and just really give our process development folks a heads up? So the experimental details, um, both monoclonal antibodies were at 10 mg per mil in a final formulation buffer. It was a CG MALS um, experiment. Um, and CG MALS, a lot of times it's to get really, really um, a, a nice wealth of information, you'll usually do at least two uh, gradient regimes, usually a high and a low, so you can kind of cover all concentrations um, you know, from really low to um, pushing closer to your actual target. Um, the first thing um, that you do when you analyze CG MALS data is you want to do a, a, what is called a naive ZIM analysis. And this is used to probe for concentration dependence um, of the calculated molecular weight. This is a ZIM analysis um, for both MABs in a um, common formulation. Um, as you can see, and as Sophia had described, if you look at the effect of the apparent molecular weight as a function of concentration, you see a downward trend of the molecular weight. When you calculate the A2 value or that interaction parameter, in both cases, it's positive. So for the first MAB, um, we get about 1.63 times 10 to the minus fourth. And for the second MAB, not a whole lot different, but what you'll see is it's, it is different. Um, we get an interaction parameter of 1.03 times 10 to the minus fourth. Um, so if you take the data and you plot the apparent molar mass as a function of concentration for both the low and the high gradients, you can clearly see how there's a downward slope um, to the response of those monoclonal antibodies to increases in concentration. Again, it reflects that negative A2 or those repulsive forces um, that are occurring up to 10 mg per mil. As predicted by the A2 value, the first monoclonal antibody with a slightly higher value displays a greater repulsive trend up to 10 mg per mil. It's not a huge difference, but it may play a role in long-term stability. So for this set of data that I have shared with you, um, as stated, the A2 values were positive, which typically indicates repulsive interactions with no obvious self-association. MAB1 with a slightly higher A2 might behave better long-term in this formulation. The next experiment that we need to do is to go to even higher concentrations as material becomes available to ensure that the repulsive interactions remain as the concentration is pushed past 10 mg per mil. Although, you know, in that lower concentration range, um, repulsive forces seem to be pretty, you know, keeping the molecule from self-associating. Um, once you get to higher concentrations, the story can change. So it's, it's always important to keep working towards um, that final concentration because complex interactions will start to occur that involve attraction and repulsion. Our next case study that I'd like to share with you is about a very interesting enzyme. Enzymes can be very challenging to formulate and stabilize, and, and that's really due to their intrinsic tendency to exist transiently in vivo. 
In this case study, an enzyme went through two independent rounds of formulation development. The first formulation, um, it was a rather quick development process, and the formulation appeared stable during development, but it failed long-term on stability. Then we took the enzyme and decided to do a little bit more in-depth formulation development, and this occurred over a six-month period. Um, where solution conditions were found to significantly stabilize the molecule. And what was really cool is that in the second formulation, the enzymatic activity in vitro increased significantly. Unlike most analytical techniques that require large dilutions and as a result may not be able to measure high molecular weight species if they're reversible, CG models can detect oligomeric states um, at higher concentration. So the purpose of the experiment was to understand the impact of the change in formulation on the oligomeric state of the enzyme, and then, then to understand the connection between that oligomeric state and um, the significant increase in the in vitro enzyme activity. We had the formulated enzyme, and it was available at 10 mg per mil. We collected MALS data for both high and low concentration gradients. Uh, as a first pass, we did a ZIM analysis to probe for concentration dependence of the calculated molecular weight. When an obvious dependence of the molecular weight on concentration was determined, the data were then analyzed by reversible association models. So this, show, this slide shows the ZIM analysis of the enzyme data as a function of formulation. So this is a plot of the apparent molar mass as a function of concentration. With the first formulation, there's a clear upward trend of the molecular mass as a function of concentration with an indication that there's definitely self-association going on. However, in the second formulation, the optimized formulation, we see a clear opposite trend where the apparent molar mass appears to decrease as the concentration is increased, indicating potential uh, repulsive interactions. So there are very dramatic differences in the effect of the protein concentration on the apparent molar mass when comparing these two formulations. The molecular weight clearly increases with protein concentration in the first formulation, indicative of self-dissociation. We could stop there, but it's kind of interesting to then take it a step further and look at it as a function of reversible association uh, models. So what additional data is gained by fitting the data to reversible association? Um, and I'm going to show it for formulation number one, which of course was non-optimal. The left plot um, gives you the light scattering signal um, as a function of total concentration. The actual data points are shown with the blue circles. The overall global fit of the data is shown by the red line. What is shown with the other symbols is that in this particular case, the best model that fit to this data um, contained monomer, dimer, trimer, and pentamers. The right side, it converts the data into the mole fraction of each species as a function of concentration. So you can see in the low concentration range, your monomer dominates. But as your concentration increases, you can start to see the dimers and the trimers and the pentamers start to grow in. It really indicated that the enzyme in the original formulation formed high molecular weight species and self-associated as a function of protein concentration, um, even at low concentrations because of the way that we can fit the data with the Astra software. We can see that dimers, trimers, and pentamers exist and increase in population as the protein concentration is increased. So from this CG Mall's example of this enzyme, um, the CG Mall's analysis clearly illuminated the fact um, that a formulation made a major impact on the tendency of the molecule to self-associate. Self and the original formulation clearly see that we're 
using higher order structure, dimer, trimer, and pentamer. And uh, these results kind of explain why we had low stability of the molecule and the formation of visible precipitation after short-term storage at 2 to 8. And the improved formulation in molecule appears to not self-associate and remains primarily from what we can see monomeric. And so linking these results to the in vitro enzymatic activity can be hypothesized that the enzyme is active as a monomeric species. All right, in this final example, I'd like to share some data with you for um, the rapid development of a small engineered protein. Absolutely, not only in the contract development and manufacturing organizations, but in biopharmaceuticals uh, in general, um, there are many instances when the needs of customers require very compressed timelines. These compressed timelines often occur when our purification development and formulation development are actually happening in parallel and at a time when protein concentration is really, really, and availability is low. At the start of our formula formulation development program, very, very compressed, we had about six weeks. There was only enough protein to screen formulations at five mg per mil, although the target concentration was at least tenfold above that. Given the nature of this molecules being engineered, so not naturally found, um, non-ideal behavior was not totally unexpected. So as the purification development was proceeding into the UFDF step, we took a preemptive examination of the effects of concentration on molecular size, so looking for potential self-association, and we investigated this by DLS and CG malls. So purpose of the experiment is to understand the impact of increasing protein concentration on the self-association, and then to understand the potential impact to the UFDF process and the ability to hit the desired final concentration. So the first experiment was um, performed on the DynaPro plate reader um, doing dynamic light scattering. And for this experiment, I only had four megas of protein available. So I exchanged the protein into the final formulation and I concentrated it down to 150 microliters. And using the Dynapro, pl Dynapro plate reader and a 384 well plate, I was able to create 20 microliter samples at decreasing concentrations of protein. And then the hydrodynamic radius of the RH versus concentration was then measured. So what did it look like? So when you plot the hydrodynamic radius as a function of protein concentration, there's a clear increase in the hydrodynamic radius as the protein concentration is increased. It's not a big change, but there's a clear dependence. When the hydrodynamic radius value increases with concentration, this is an indication of possible self-association of the molecule. You can further examine the data by plotting the diffusion coefficient, or DT, as a function of protein concentration. And Sophia had described this earlier. When you take the linear fit of the diffusion co coefficient as a function of concentration and you divide the slope by the y-intercept, it provides a value called KD, like an association constant. Um, KD values can provide information regarding the propensity of a molecule to self-associate. Negative KDs predict association. So what about CG malls? Um, so it's such a neat thing that you can couple these two assays together and the, the amount of information that you can get out is, is amazing. So for this, we did a CG malls experiment. Um, I only had enough protein to start at 20 mg per mil. Um, due to both volume requirements and protein availability. What I can tell you is this work was occurring in serious parallel to um, the downstream processing. So we were grabbing whatever we could um, when it became available from our development scientists. And so using the Calypso 2 instrument and the Dawn Helios and the um, OptiLab T-Rex, concentration gradients from 20 to 4 micromil were performed. So initially, ZIM analysis of the data set was performed, and that is shown on the right-hand side. You can see that in this case, the apparent molecular weight appears to decrease as a function of concentration, and we get a positive A2 value 
it's small at 4.12 times 10 to the fifth. But then we've got conflicting results. We have a positive A2, which indicates repulsion, but from DLS we have a negative KD, which indicates some attraction. So what that tells us is there's complex interactions going on, and we've got to think about it a little harder. <laughs> when we put the information together, so we have an apparent um, molar mass, and that's shown in blue, and it's the data that was shown before. And you can see it appears to decrease as a function of concentration. However, when you can apply the correction factor using the A2, that interaction parameter, the direction of the molecular weight dependence reverses to the molecular weight increasing just ever so slightly with concentration. When you have a complex problem, you work with Sophia <laughs> and you simulate um, what you might expect um, to see in a situation like this. So in this simulation, which is the dotted line, this is based on a hard sphere model with no interaction. The actual data is shown in the blue diamonds, clearly not a match with no interaction simulation. So there's got to be some interactions occurring. The initial ZIMFIT of the data, which is the red line, doesn't completely match the data either. It's close, but it's not quite there. The best fit included a small contribution from a dimer species. So the conclusions for this is that the Dynapro plate reader allows for the investigation of hydrodynamic radiuses at very low volumes. It's so ideal when little protein is available. In this case study, the DLS data was of high quality. The correlation curves were it was a clear, absolutely clear trend, and we saw a distinct protein concentration dependence in a delta RH range of only a nanometer. When we compared the negative KD values from DLS and the positive A2 values from CG malls, it was suspected that complex interactions in, involving both attractive and repulsive forces were occurring. The power of data simulation helped to discern among the various interaction scenarios and led the analysis in the most meaningful direction. Higher concentration gradient studies for this protein are in the planning stages. I do have more material now. And as we proceed into larger scale manufacturing, we'll be able to um, hopefully mitigate some of these things that are going on. So overall, in, in my world, um, light scattering techniques are core biophysical assays in our characterization toolbox. We learn so much from these te techniques that um, other techniques due to dilution um, or not being able to handle the high concentrations, we don't always get to see these types of interactions. Light scattering is universal. It's not limited by the type or the state of the protein molecule. In, in our business here at Fujifilm Dyson, Dyson Biotechnology, we use light scattering techniques throughout the development process to aid in downstream purification, analytical assay troubleshooting, and formulation development. We also expand this technique to investigate stability issues and to assess end-use effects on drug products, like you know, holding the product in a syringe or an IV bag, issues with full finished containers, and so forth. Um, as a protein scientist, my introduction to light scattering has been relatively short, it, over about three years, but just the data that I'm starting to collect with these methods and what I'm learning through Wyatt, is, it, it just makes me so motivated to learn more about light scattering and data interpretation, because what I want to do is to increase the utility of these applications towards the success of our clients. With that, I'd like to thank you so much for you know, attending this webinar and sticking around to the end. And I'd like to thank Wyatt Technology for inviting me to be a part of this. If you need further information, you're more than welcome to contact either Sophia or myself at the email addresses shown below. With that, uh, I thank you so much. And um, I think we'll go back to Elizabeth for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowers. We have had so many questions come in. We're only going to be able to get to a couple of them, but I can assure you that I will be forwarding those questions on to our presenters, and you'll receive an answer to all of your questions via email. First question, 
what is the typical range of DN slash DC you find experimentally for biotherapeutics in aqueous PBS buffer? So that's a great question. The textbook answer to that is that 99% of proteins have a DNDC in water of 0.185, um, and there are things that can affect that. So like a high arginine content, like for crystallins, can push that up to you know, the 0.19 range, changing your formulation condition, so increasing the refractive index, like by adding lots of sucrose, can decrease that value to the 0.17 kind of a range. And we have some materials that can help you determine how to measure that and when, when to start worrying about those changes. Okay, and a follow-up question from the same attendee. What impact on size is there in just using a literature value, for example, 0 0.185, BSA and PBS, pH 7.5, versus experimentally derived DN slash DC in similar conditions? So in a, in a SecMOLS kind of experiment where you have your uh, light scattering detector and your RI as a concentration source, um, any error that you have in DNDC is going to be proportional to your error in molecular weight. So if you're 2% off in the DNDC, you'll be 2% off in the molecular weight. Okay. And a couple questions from another attendee. Is there any way to study ternary or quaternary complex formation and stoichiometry using CG MALS? So also a, a great question. Um, so for CG MALS, um, between any two species, so if you have got, you know, protein A and protein B, we can measure almost any stoichiometry. So if it's forming one-to-one, one-to-two, or if, you know, protein A is also dimerizing and that dimer may be active, we can do all of those different combinations. And our Calypso software will readily take that data and fit it. There are some examples of doing a ternary study of like an, a protein A, B, and C. Um, but it, as you can imagine, it gets pretty complex and our software doesn't have that capability. We do have an example on our website in one of our application notes where we did that kind of experiment. And so we pre-mixed A and B and in our example, they happened to form a, a covalent complex so that AB turned into just a single species again. Um, and so that's, that's one example you can do. And you can certainly take that data um, and, and do the math uh, to, do, to fit those more complex stoichiometries. Okay. And there are many, many more questions, but I see we're actually past the hour. So I'll make sure to forward these questions on to Dr. Bowers and Dr. Kenrick. Thank you so much, both of you, for your wonderful presentations. I'd like to thank Wyatt Technologies for sponsoring today's web event. And most of all, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent some time with us. We really appreciate your attendance, and we hope the information proves helpful to you. So with that, I will say goodbye and have a great day.